The Lorax by Dr. Seuss. At the far end of town where the grickle grass grows, and the wind smells slow and sour when it blows, and no birds ever sing, excepting old crows, is the street of the lifted Lorax. And deep in the grickle grass, some people say, if you look deep enough, you can still see today where the Lorax once stood just as long as it could before somebody lifted the Lorax away. What was the Lorax? Why was it there? And why was it lifted and taken somewhere from the far end of town where the grickle grass grows? The old Wunsler still lives there. Ask him. He knows. You won't see the Wunsler. Don't knock at his door. He stays in his lurkum on top of his store. He lurks in his lurkum cold under the roof, where he makes his own clothes out of myth muffered moof. And on special dank midnights in August, he peeks out of the shutters, and sometimes he speaks and tells how the Lorax was lifted away. He'll tell you, perhaps, if you're willing to pay. On the end of a rope, he lets down a tin pail, and you have to toss in 15 cents and a nail and the shell of a great-great-great-grandfather snail. Then he pulls up the pail, makes a most careful count to see if you've paid him the proper amount. Then he hides what you paid him away in his snub, his secret strange hole in his gravulous glove. Then he grunts, I will call you by whisper phone, for the secrets I tell are for your ears alone. Slup. Down slups the whisper phone to your ear, and the old onesler's whispers are not very clear, since they have to come down through a snurgly hose, and he sounds as if he had smallish bees up his nose. Now I'll tell you, he says, with his teeth sounding gray, how the Lorax got lifted and taken away. It all started way back, such a long, long time back. Way back in the days when the grass was still green, and the pond was still wet, and the clouds were still clean, and the song of the Swami Swans rang out in space. One morning I came to this glorious place, and I first saw the trees, the truffle trees, the bright colored tufts of the truffle trees, mile after mile in the fresh morning breeze. And under the trees, I saw brown barbalutes frisking about in their barbalute suits as they played in the shade and ate truffle fruits. From the ribulous pond came the comfortable sound of the humming fish humming while splashing around. But those trees, those trees, those truffle trees, all my life I'd been searching for trees such as these. The touch of their tufts was much softer than silk and they had the sweet smell of fresh butterfly milk. I felt a great leaping of joy in my heart. I knew just what I'd do. I unloaded my cart. In no time at all, I had built a small shop. Then I chopped down a truffle tree with one chop. And with great skillful skill and with great speedy speed, I took the soft tuft and I knitted a thneed. The instant I finished, I heard a guzz zump. I looked. I saw something pop out of the stump of the tree I had chopped down. It was sort of a man. Describe him? That's hard. I don't know if I can. He was shortish and oldish and brownish and mossy, and he spoke with a voice that was sharpish and bossy. Mister, he said with a sawdusty sneeze, I am the Lorax. I speak for the trees. I speak for the trees, for the trees have no tongues. And I am asking you, sir, at the top of my lungs. He was very upset as he shouted and puffed. What's that thing you've made out of my truffle tuft? Look, Lorax, I said, there's no cause for alarm. I chopped just one tree. I am doing no harm. I am being quite useful. This thing is a thneed. A thneed's a fine something that all people need. It's a shirt. It's a sock. It's a glove. It's a hat but it has other uses, yes, far beyond that. You can use it for carpets, for pillows, for sheets, or curtains, or covers for bicycle seats. The Lorax said, Sir, you are crazy with greed. There is no one on earth who would buy that fool's need. But the very next minute, I proved he was wrong. For just at that minute, a chap came along, and he thought that the need I had knitted was great. He happily bought it for three ninety-eight. 
I laughed at the Lorax. You poor, stupid guy. You never can tell what some people will buy. I repeat, cried the Lorax. I speak for the trees. I'm busy, I told him. Shut up, if you please. I rushed across the room, and in no time at all, built a radio phone. I put in a quick call. I called all my brothers and uncles and aunts, and I said, Listen here, here's a wonderful chance for the whole Wunsler family to get mighty rich. Get over here fast. Take the road to North Niche. Turn left at Weehawken, sharp right at South Stitch. And in no time at all, in the factory I built, the whole Wunsler family was working full tilt. We were all knitting thneeds just as busy as bees to the sound of the chopping of truffle trees. Then, oh baby, oh, how my business did grow. Now, chopping one tree at a time was too slow. So I quickly invented my super axe hacker, which whacked off four truffle trees at one smacker. We were making thneeds four times fast as before, and that Lorax, he didn't show up anymore. But the next week he knocked on my new office door. He snapped, I'm the Lorax who speaks for the trees, which you seem to be chopping as fast as you please. But I'm also in charge of the brown barbalutes who played in the shade in their barbalute suits and happily lived eating truffle fruits. Now, thanks to your hacking my trees to the ground, there's not enough truffle fruit to go round and my poor barbalutes are all getting the crummies because they have gas and no food in their tummies. They loved living here, but I can't let them stay. They'll have to find food, and I hope that they may. Good luck, boys, he cried, and he sent them away. I, the Wunsler, felt sad as I watched them all go. But business is business, and business must grow, regardless of crummies and tummies, you know. I meant no harm. I most truly did not. But I had to grow bigger, so bigger I got. I biggered my factory, I biggered my roads, I biggered my wagons, I biggered the loads of needs I shipped out. I was shipping them forth, to the south, to the east, to the west, to the north. I went right on biggering, selling more needs, and I biggered my money, which everyone needs. Then again he came back. I was fixing some pipes when that old nuisance Lorax came back with more gripes. I am the Lorax, he coughed and he whiffed. He sneezed and he snuffled, he snargled, he sniffed. Wunsler, he cried with a cruffulous croak. Wunsler, you're making such smogulous smoke. My poor swami swans, why they can't sing a note. No one can sing who has smog in his throat. And so, said the Lorax, please pardon my cough. They cannot live here, so I'm sending them off. Where will they go? I don't hopefully know. They may have to fly for a month or a year to escape from the smog you've smogged up around here. What's more, snapped the Lorax. His dander was up. Let me say a few words about gluppity glup. Your machinery chugs on day and night without stop, making gluppity glup. Also, schloppity schlop. And what do you do with this leftover goo? I'll show you, you dirty old Wunsler man, you. You're glumping the pond where the humming fish hummed. No more can they hum for their gills are all gummed. So I'm sending them off. Oh, their future is dreary. They'll walk on their fins and get woefully weary in search of some water that isn't so smeary. And then I got mad. I got terribly mad. I yelled at the Lorax. Now listen here, dad. All you do is yap, yap, and say bad, 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 bad. Well, I have my rights, sir, and I'm telling you, I intend to go on doing just what I do. For your information, you Lorax, I'm figuring on biggering and biggering and biggering and biggering, turning more truffle trees into thneeds, which everyone, everyone, everyone needs. And at that very moment, we heard a loud whack. From outside in the fields came a sickening smack of an ax on a tree. Then we heard the tree fall, the very last truffle a tree of them all. No more trees, no more thneeds, no more work to be done. 
So in no time, my uncles and aunts, every one, all waved me goodbye. They jumped into my cars and drove away under smoke-smuggered stars. Now all that was left neath the bad-smelling sky was my big empty factory, the Lorax and I. The Lorax said nothing, just gave me a glance, just gave me a very sad, sad backward glance as he lifted himself by the seat of his pants. And I'll never forget the grim look on his face when he heisted himself and took leave of this place through a hole in the smog without leaving a trace. And all that the Lorax left here in this mess was a small pile of rocks with one word, unless. Whatever that meant, well, I just couldn't guess. That was long, long ago, but each day since that day, I've sat here and worried and worried away. Through the years while my buildings have fallen apart, I've worried about it with all of my heart. But now, says the Wensler, now that you're here, the word of the Lorax seems perfectly clear. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. So catch, calls the Wensler. He lets something fall. It's a truffle seed. It's the last one of all. You're in charge of the last of the truffle seeds. And truffle trees are what everyone needs. Plant a new truffle, treat it with care, give it clean water and feed it fresh air. Grow a forest, protect it from axes that hack. Then the Lorax and all of his friends may come back.